This is part six, or rather eight, of uh, the study that we've entitled The Physical Death of the Believer. It will probably be the last installment in this uh, particular series. We're going to have a brief bit of review. I had a question this morning on cremation. What does the Bible say about cremation? And I said, it's, it's fine if you want to be cremated. And I uh, said, well, little question, question look on the face. And I said, what if you were a missionary eaten by an alligator? You know, the same thing. You are digested. Uh, so God is able through your genetic code to resurrect your body and to fit it to your soul. Uh, but that's that's another subject. Sometime we'll go over those particular doctrines. But right now we want to just review the doctrine of the shadow of death. Uh, we learned about nine different points regarding this, and I want to refresh your memory. The first thing we learned was that it is a definite place. And in a little while I will show you that people still go there today. You and I are literally going to walk in this territory. That, that's exactly what it is. Uh, it's an interim place uh, between earth and heaven or earth and hell, but it is a definite, uh, tangible place, just simply in the next dimension. We then learned that it's a place of gloom. Uh, when you die, you are going to be there by yourself. Now there are exceptions, and that's what this business of dying grace is about. When you die in fellowship, you enter the valley of the shadow of death with the Lord as your personal guide. And uh, that's the hope of dying in fellowship, uh, as well as many other things. But uh, in any case, if you go there alone, it's a place of gloom, darkness. Things are obscure, and it's very lonely. Thirdly, we learned that once you enter there, you sort of have to grope and feel your way because there are no navigational fixes. You can't uh, set your sights upon a star and say that's north. Uh, it's more or less a tunnel of sorts, a, a, a corridor lined with clouds. And there is no apparent order there. And uh, that's what it says. There are no set arrangements. Seemingly, it's just because you've entered this place and you uh, have to grope. Uh, God himself has an order to it and he knows how, uh, how it is arranged, but you do not unless you have a guide. Fourth, we learned that it has definite gates and doors. Once you enter, they're usually closed behind you and you can't get back out. You have to push forward to the end. It is a place with definite boundaries. In other words, uh, it's not all over the universe. It has a set beginning and ending and uh, uh, in between. Sixth, it is a place of extreme darkness. Now basically, uh, and I'll show you what I mean in a little bit, the gross darkness has to do with the clouds that are concentrated that form the walls or the, the lining of this particular place called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. They, they are thick, and uh, actually the Bible uses the word gross, and it just indicates something that is extremely thick or extremely dark. The light cannot penetrate. But it does do something, point seven. It exits into light. Now, it's both good and bad because there is light in two realms, or one realm divided into two places, uh, but in the dispensation of grace, there's actually two realms. God, once you start, he brings you out into light. Eight, when you're there alone, it is a place of extreme dread. Uh, you are frightened because you are groping uh, and you're unsure. And then lastly, Psalms 23, it is a valley to be traversed. Everybody's going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But if you have the Lord as your shepherd, he will go with you. Therefore, you don't have to fear evil. And this word, ge, means a valley, a steep valley, or a narrow gorge. And we'll explain that. Okay. Uh, 
Just before we look at the valley of the shadow of death, as it was under the Old Testament economies, we define dying grace. It is a gift of a special mental attitude that is given to you by God's grace when you're near death or at the point of death so that you are prepared for this event. You can actually anticipate it with happiness. Now, uh, I'm, I don't believe that you hear this much by way of the secular world. Death is the dreaded experience, but not for a Christian in fellowship. It is that transition from this life to the next which brings happiness, and you can die happy and simply go into the presence of the Lord uh, with a blessing, with a smile. Dying in this state is the ultimate means of departure from this life. No other death brings glory directly to the Lord except those who die in dying grace. Now, we've got two more points, and then we're going to look at this particular valley of the shadow of death. Two more things about dying grace that we need to see. Why do I emphasize this? Because I want you to have dying grace. This morning it was uncanny, very un unusual. Usually I have one or two that will raise their hands in an invitation. And uh, I looked around and nobody raised their hand. And I wanted to say, I know that probably there might be a few here that are not prepared. You don't know enough doctrine. If you were to face death now, you would panic. Because only in the state of dying grace is it characteristically free of panic. And we'll show you some examples. There is no dread. I know where I'm going. There is no instability. You don't fall apart. It is typified by confidence, courage, and composure. You do simply what the Old Testament saints did what the Lord Jesus Christ did, you give up the ghost and you go home to be with the Lord. That's exactly what you do. Now, I want to show you what I believe the valley of the shadow of death is. You've seen this before. Over here we have paradise, Abraham's bosom. Over here you have torments. And here you have the great gulf that is fixed. Here is where the light is, which is seen at the end of the tunnel. You know the proverbial light at the end of, of, of the tunnel? And someone said, if it's my luck, it would be the light of an oncoming train. Well, that might be true. In the case of this side of Hades, or hell, it's true. Because when you start down this corridor of the valley of the shadow of death, as you are groping there, and I've drawn this, of course, it's shortened, but it heads toward the center of the earth. That's where you're going. Hell, Hades, is in the center of the earth. And we'll prove that to you in just a little bit. But when you go down that place, you then slip and you see the light and you come and you, your eyes are open and you're in a place called torments. But on the other side, you come through the valley of the shadow of death and uh, you see the light at the end of the tunnel. But actually, and I'll show you what I mean, you have light yourself as you traverse or walk through this valley. All right. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus Christ is going to make an interesting statement here that I want to explain in light of what we're studying. We said that the valley of the shadow of death has doors. Jesus Christ referred to these doors as the gates of hell or Hades. In verse number 18, he says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now what he meant by that is that there are a lot of Old Testament saints in paradise or Abraham's bosom. All of them are, are there. And 
if he were to fail in his task, Lucifer, who is, who, who is the angel of death, as it were, who intimidates people by having this power over them, would simply lock the gates of hell, and they are stuck in this area forever. They can't go to heaven. They can't come back up on the earth. Lucifer has locked the gates of hell. But because Jesus Christ died on the cross and uh, um, was victorious over Lucifer, turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And verse number 18. I am he that lives and was dead, reference to his cross work and his victory over the angelic conflict, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. There, that's what it is. Jesus Christ now has the key to open the door. He can lock this side and keep the people in torments there forever. And he will in the, in the lake of fire, ultimately. But on, on this side, he can open up the gate. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ actually went down into the place called paradise. And we find this in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 9. Hell, or Hades, is in the lower part of the earth. We've had this many times before, but I just want to remind you of, uh, of this so that I can show you what the valley of the shadow of death is. When you die, or when an, un an unbeliever dies, these gates or doors are open. You then enter one of the two corridors in the valley of the shadow of death, and you begin your descent down there. Now, this is in Old Testament times. New Testament times, when we are, are saved, we still have a, a shadow, a corridor, as it were, from earth to heaven that we go face to face with the Lord. But it is a, is a definite tube or, or a passageway into the presence of the Lord. It's called the, the uh, shadow of death. But now, this is the way it looks, and um, except this side is empty. Why? Verse 9. Now he, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first unto the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens. Now what did he do? He unlocked the gates of hell, which cannot prevail. The gates of hell cannot keep these Old Testament saints locked there forever. Lucifer didn't win. Christ got the keys. He can keep these prisoners in there forever. You know, when it says he's going to go and preach freedom or liberty to the prisoners, where are they? They're imprisoned here. And, uh, and is he going to win? Is he going to lose? He won. And therefore, he has the keys of death and hell. Okay. Now, uh, let's uh, go to Luke chapter 16. I've, I've got a fly, and this fly is coming and landing right on my bald spot there. He's a little bug, and I think he, he thinks this is a landing pad for some reason. I've often questioned, why did God make flies? Why did he do that? Uh, I... I can understand the purpose of other insects, but just the pesky fly. Okay, I'm not questioning God. Uh, I'm not interested in traversing the gates of hell yet. Yes, sir. Oh well, <laughs> at least at least there's some good to it. That, that the flies come from the maggots. Yes. Okay. Now I see. Okay, Luke chapter 16. <laughs> We're, yeah, <laughs> yes. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I 
Now, Jill was the one who asked me about cremation. And when I said, well, what if you're eaten by an alligator? It, it shook him up so much, he came back tonight. <laughs> no, he, he really did, though. Okay. Now, uh, verse number uh, 22. We, we know this story. I've used it to illustrate this. But what I want to do is to, to show you something as to explaining the shadow of death and personal escort in, into either paradise or not, none for torments. Verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died. Note what it says. And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. When he entered this side of the valley of the shadow of death, he had a personal escort. Now, hold your place here and go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 7. Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 7. How do I know he had light? Because God made his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Now, you know, uh, talk about lightning bugs. He had, he had two escorts on, on each side of him. Here he is in the middle. One on each side that provided uh, light. They're uh, translucent beings. They shine. And so, therefore, he entered the valley of the shadow of death. But he, did, he, he didn't fear evil. Why? Because he had a personal light escort that took him all the way there. Now, not only that, continue to hold your place. Go back to Exodus chapter 14. Now, having light at the end of the tunnel and seeing it afar off and tripping all the way through the cave or the tunnel to get to that light, on having light by your side is two different things. Verse number uh, 19 of Exodus 14. Here's something else that God does, in my opinion, that when a believer in fellowship enters the valley of the shadow of death, he not only has these lighted beings to escort him to paradise, but he also has something that God does to the clouds. And I've, what I've done here was try my best to, to sh show that the valley of the shadow of death is lined with clouds. We saw it from Job and other, other verses. But note what God can do with a cloud. Verse 19, the angel of, the, of God which went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. It was a cloud and darkness to them, the Egyptians, but it gave light by night to those, the Israelites, so that one came not near the other all the night. On this side, it remained gloomy for the rich man as he went through. But on this side, God made the cloud light. And as well, he had two beings of light. So you need not fear stumbling, tripping, falling into a, a ditch, a, a pit, or what have you. The angels escort all the way. Now come back to Luke uh, 16. What happened to the rich man? You'll note the absence of escort. He traveled the valley of the shadow of death by himself. Luke 16, 22. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. He simply left his body, entered into the valley of the shadow of death. He stumbled his way down because the doors are closed and locked behind him, he ended up in torments, and he realized he was in dire straits. Now, the light, of course, there's a great gulf fixed, and the light, of course, is the light of Hades. On the one side, it means punishment. On the other side, it means bliss and paradise. 
Okay, now just before we get into the doctrine of dying grace, I want to go back here. And uh, if you would, come with me to 1 Corinthians 15. And I want to explain something to you. Do you ever have um, somebody care enough about you to warn you over something that might hurt? Well, all of us have our parents and other people who care. Okay, as a pastor, I care about you, and I don't want you to experience something, ultimately, that is known as a sting. The only way you can get around this sting is to be in fellowship with God when you die. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now, the Apostle Paul is alluding to two things here. One is resurrection. The gates of hell cannot prevail against your body. That, that, uh, that undertaker, when you die, locks you in the coffin. But... There is no coffin, there is no iron gate that is going to keep you in there because Jesus Christ has the key to death and hell. But what about this sting? The sting of death is sin. Reference the old sin nature. The strength of sin is the law. Just as uh, the law is righteousness, but you can have uh, degrees in, in between, you can be rebellious to a certain point. Under the full control of the old sin nature when you die, and you die in that, that state, you're going to sting. Now, I've got it sh shown here. If you're under the control of the old sin nature, the old sin nature lives in your body. But if the body's dead, and this oh, the old sin nature has a nature, has a sense to it, has a life to it, if it senses that it's not going to live any longer, it's going to do everything possible to hold that body and soul together. That's why you see people sometimes when they die. You see them in the movies. They're, they, they flap around, and you know, they say they've got a real strong will, and they're trying to, to, to uh, hang on to life. Much of it, in my opinion, is that the old sin nature is grabbing on to the extremities of the soul, going through the um, central nervous system, trying to keep the soul in the body, so that God virtually says, it's your time, and he has to extract you. And, oh, there's a sting there. That's what the sting is. The old sin nature holding on to the soul and saying, I won't let you go. I live in this body and this body stays alive as long as the soul is in the body. And that's what's going on here. And that's called the sting of death. But that's why Paul says, thanks be to God, verse 57, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You die in fellowship. Who is the one who lives in your body when the old sin nature is neutralized. The Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who sin The old sin nature is dead. It has no power to hold you in. There's no sting. That's why he says to the old sin nature. <laughs> he, he's addressing it here. Where is the sting? <laughs> Jesus Christ has given us the victory. Because of him, we have the Holy Spirit living in our human spirit, but in fellowship, he lives in our body. That's his rightful home. In our body, he simply says, the body is sealed. I must give it up now. That's one of the reasons why he groans, but still, uh, I'm going to give it up. But I, I've sealed this body. The body dies, and he just simply lets the soul, the, the old sin nature lets the soul go. It has no power. And one other thing I wanted you to uh, understand is that Please remember that the first thing you do, well, I'm running out of ink there. The first thing you do is go through something material when you die. What is that? This is actually how you look. The spirit is the innermost part, then the soul, then the body that surrounds it. You die, you go through a material body into the presence of the Lord. 
Again, just let me say, this explains these verses of Scripture. What is the sting of death? The sting of death is people who are dying under the control of the old sin nature. And God has to extract them, and there is a sting as that, as that happens. Now, if you're in fellowship with the Lord, the Holy Spirit neutralizes the old sin nature so that you can die in peace. You simply give up the ghost. There's nothing that holds you here. That's the point. Now, if, if you're trying to hold yourself here and, and the old sin nature is rebelling, it's going to hurt when you die. There'll be no peace. There'll be pain. But if you die in fellowship, I guarantee you, you won't be stung. All right. Now, let's go all the way to the doctrine of dying grace. Turn to Amos chapter 5. With the time we have remaining, we'll go point by point through the doctrine of dying grace. Point one, you can't get dying grace from anyone but God. God alone provides dying grace. Amos chapter 5 verse 8 says this, Seek him that makes the seven stars and Orion, and note this, turns the shadow of death into the morning. The word turn, ha fak in the Hebrew, means to transform it. That's exactly what he does. That's why I believe that the clouds are turned to light. Isn't it interesting? You open the, you open the door and it's darkness, and God says, uh, you're in fellowship with me now. Uh, just reach up and pull the switch. Boom, the lights come on. And here are two guys that uh, you don't need a lantern because they'll, they'll take you and they shine all the way through to the end. You'll see the light at the end of the tunnel in the distance there, but uh, again, you'll have light all the way. He transforms the valley of the shadow of death into light. The valley of the shadow, Samaveth, meaning the death shadow, uh, the gloom, the netherworld, he turns it into mourning. Boker meaning daylight or, darn it, uh, or dawning. We uh, just uh, sang the song in the choir. And the darkness shall turn to dawning. When is that going to happen for you? When you go through the valley of the shadow. All right. Psalms 48. Psalms 48. Verse 14. Point two is that God himself provides you a personal escort. Now, I'm <laughs> saying this, I, I don't want to say that God runs an escort service. That sort of sounds a little bad. I didn't uh, want to do that. But in essence, he does. Now, it's the type of escort service um, in essence, that the, the funeral homes have. When somebody dies, they hire some uh, a man with a motorcycle and he escorts the body there, stopping all traffic. And in this sense, God provides a personal escort, himself through the light of the clouds or, or with the angels. 4814 in Psalms, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto, literally, through death, the valley of the shadow of death. Guide, nah, hog, personal escort. Now, in Psalms 23, point three, there's a reason that he does that. And it's recognized in this very familiar portion of Scripture. Psalm 23, verse 4. Point three, his presence eliminates fear. Now, I know that the bravest of the bravest people here, men and women, when you enter a situation of darkness, you begin to panic. It's only natural. But what God does is turn on the light. But more than that, 
He eliminates fear. Remember, it's a, the valley of the shadow of death is a place of horrors, terrors, dread. But, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The word fear there is uh, yare, which means extreme fear and dread. You become an emotional basket case. What am I going to do? You're frightened. But when the Lord is there, I will fear no evil, no, no harm. And that's what it is, ra in the Hebrew, unpleasantness, any discomfort. Now you'll remember that your body is already dead. You have exited through the material your body. If you're in fellowship, you've had no discomfort. There's no sting of, of, uh, of death if you're in fellowship. God the Holy Spirit sees to that. The sting comes from the old sin nature grasping at your soul. I'll not let it go. It's a, it's a tug of war. It's tugging one way. God's tugging the, the next. And finally, when it gives up, there's a snap there that stings you. Thou art. Here it is. Ata, personal pronoun, you personally are with me. That's why I don't fear. The God of the universe, the omnipotent one, the Lord of hosts, God Almighty. If the Lord's for us, who shall be against us? I'm not afraid of death or the shadow of death. All right. Let's go back then to 1 Corinthians 15. And point four, dying grace then is actually achieved before you die. Now, if you're out of fellowship and you get back in fellowship because you have a, a measured amount of doctrine in your soul, uh, you can still have dying grace. But the point is that you arrive at this state of being constantly ready to die. At any moment, if God calls you home, you, he simply opens the door and you, and you go through it. You're ready. 1531, verse 30 says, Why stand we in jeopardy every hour as believers? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus. I die daily. See? He had dying grace. Why? Because at any time he knew that through persecution he could be taken home to be with the Lord. He readied himself every morning when he got up. Every morning. Hamera in the Greek for day, meaning each and every day. But the word die, apothnesko, means to constantly prepare to die off. Apo indicates that I'm ready to die off. Christians were dying off. He, being baptized for the dead means that he was placed into the ranks of those who had dying grace, who gave themselves as martyrs. And he put himself right in the ranks. And if need be, he was ready to die. And of course, we see this as well from 2 Timothy 4, and we'll be there later. Proverbs 14, point 5. I don't know about you, but I like this because death has always been somewhat of a mystery to me. No one has ever expounded it. No one has ever explained it. No one has ever prepared me. And I've been, been through college and seminary, and they always talk around it, talk about it, but never must say much about it. To me, now I understand where I'm going and hopefully how I'm going to get there with an angelic escort. Actually, for the church-age believers, it's the, the escort of God, the Holy Spirit himself. But the principle is the same. Proverbs 14.32 gives us point five. Dying grace is based upon the believer's hope. Verse uh, 14.32, rather. Verse 32 says, The wicked is driven away in his righteousness. Excuse me, in his wickedness. What does that mean? He dies and he's cast by the angels into everlasting fire. The door closes. He, he is forced down the steep valley of the shadow of death. And once he gets to the light at the end of the tunnel, it's his doom. But the righteous has hope in his death. The word hope, 
kasa means confidence in the place of refuge. Just like when Noah went into the ark and God shut the door, he was safe on the inside. You enter the valley of the shadow of death and God shuts the door and you're safe. You don't have to fear evil. That's the believer's hope. You have confidence in the Lord. You can anticipate blessing on the other side. It's just a short trip, as it were, and you anticipate blessing all the way. All right, now, Let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Now, one good thing about each person that's mentioned here in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11 is that each and every one of them had dying grace when they died. That's, that's wonderful. Not only did they live faithful to the Lord, but they died faithful to him. How do I know? Verse 13. These all died in faith. Greek, kata, meaning in keeping with the standard of faithfulness. They were absent from the body. They went to be with the Lord, or actually in the Old Testament, to go to Abraham's bosom, as we just explained. But still, the principle is the same. They didn't receive the promises, but they saw them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. But what did they do? They literally died in fellowship. And that's what it's talking about here. Every single person who lived for the Lord died for him. And in their death, though they didn't have God to bless them with, with a glorified body at that point, they died looking at the promises, knowing that my Redeemer lives and I shall in this body see him stand that latter day on the earth. They knew they'd be resurrected. And they died in fellowship, embracing, claiming the promises of God when they died. This is known as the death of the righteous. Numbers 23.10. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers 23, 10. All right. It says there, Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, let my last end be like his. In other words, the termination of his earthly existence. It's called by Balaam here, speaking prophetically, the death of the righteous. And he just said, you can't curse what God has blessed. And who does he mention? He mentions a guy who has a pretty neat death, Jacob. Genesis 14, uh, 49, 33. Genesis 49, 33. Righteous, yashar, meaning upright. He died in faith. He died in such a complete fellowship with God. And remember, Hebrews 11, 21 says that he worshiped God leaning upon a staff. He was getting weak in his body, but as far as his spiritual life was concerned, he was strong. How do, how do we know? Because of Hebrews 11, because of Numbers 23.10, let me die the death of the righteous like Jacob. When I die, said Balaam, I want to be like him. How did he die? Verse 33, when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, I like this, he gathered his feet up into the bed and yielded up the ghost. He said, I'm going, I'm going to lie down, I'm going to go home now. He just gathered, he knew. In other words, he had, he pretty much had command of the situation, almost like Christ did in full fellowship. And remember, God, uh, we're right about this sting of death theology. He just simply said, I'm ready. He gathered up his feet, he covered himself up, and was gathered unto his people. Two gatherings there, his feet and himself to his people, and he just gave up the ghost. Now that's how simple and easy it can be when you die the death of the righteous. 
But if you're unrighteous or controlled by the old sin nature, it's difficult. You don't want to give up and give in. The old sin nature doesn't want to give up and give in. Turn uh, uh, to the book of Job, chapter 1. Job was another one who died in fellowship. And what was his attitude toward holding on to this life? Verse 21. Job 1, 21, naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Didn't have anything when I entered, I'm not going to have anything when I leave. And I want to die a death glorifying to him. He was in fellowship. He maintained his integrity. All right? The Apostle Paul then warns us, 1 Timothy 6, the same thing. 1 Timothy 6, where he said, verse 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Verse 9, they that will be rich, in other words, they forget the Lord and set their sights on riches, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. What are the hurtful lusts? They begin to die and they don't want to leave. And the old sin nature snatches onto their soul and it's the tug of war there. And eventually, snap, it goes and boy, the pain that's experienced. Of course, it uh, diminishes and goes away. But that's the sting of death. And that's why it's best to die the death of the righteous. All right, a few, few more minutes here. Just uh, two more to go. Job, both times. Job 13. Dying grace is based upon the believer's trust in God. Job 13, 15. Where it says... Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. The word slay, of course, means to cut off. He's speaking of physical death. Yakal, trust, means I'm going to rely upon him patiently. I realize with all of these sores, with my ill health, that most probably, like my children, I'm going to be... Uh, in eternity before too long, but it doesn't matter to me. Physical death can be an exhilarating, stimulating experience, dying in full fellowship with the Lord. Though he slay me, I'm just going to trust him. If it's my time, it's my time. I'm ready to go, says, says Job. He so trusted in the Lord that he relied upon him to make the right sovereign decision regarding his death. And last, in Job 19, verse 25. What is the last thing about dying grace that we want to see and to understand? That dying grace is based upon the believer's knowledge. That is why my insistence on learning Bible doctrine I don't know how people do it. And well, I know how they do it. They fall apart. I've been there. I've, I've been in the ministry for over 20 years. I don't know how long it's been uh, for, to quit tabulating, I, I gather. But I've, I've had a lot of funerals. I've been in a lot of deathbeds and sick beds and so forth. And people fall, what am I going to do? Where am I going? They're so unsure. And the reason is they, some pastor has evangelized them all of their lives. And when it, come, it came time for them to die, they didn't know what to do. That's nonsense. You're going to die. So am I. And unless you die this death, you're going to have pain and trouble. He, he did a disservice to those people by not telling them how to die and get around the sting of death. And that's why they die so painfully. You don't have to die that way. 
It would be the greatest thrill of my life that when your time came and when my time would come, that you and I would check out of this planet in full fellowship with God. He just simply takes our soul home to be with himself. Now, you have to know how to die. And that's why the last point here is dying grace is given to you on the basis of knowledge. You have to know about death, where you're going, the shadow of death, how to be in fellowship and to sustain it, where you're heading to, and who's going to escort you there. Verse number 25 says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Remember, these all died in faith. They didn't receive the realization of the promise, but they died embracing them because they saw them afar off. Okay, I'll die now. That's fine. You're going you're gonna to raise me, and I'm going to experience them down the line. That's what Job is saying. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he, he's not going to forget me, shall stand that day, shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in this flesh shall I see God. Yada means to know and to understand the facts and the implications. They died in fellowship, not receiving the promises, but the implication was that God is going to bring them from the dead and fulfill everything they had promised to them, only this time in a glorified resurrection body.